Hey everybody, welcome to Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. Listen, I'm gonna give it to you straight. Things are getting tough out there. Fare increases, toll increases, gas taxes, mass transit underfunded, fiscal cliffs and tax revenue concerns as budget season approaches. Meanwhile, the planet is falling apart, flooding somewhere new every week. We are at war with our environment on so many levels. We're gonna talk about that in our second half, but we begin today with the growing field of gubernatorial candidates. The first official Republican candidate, Senator John Bramnick, he joins us now. Senator, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Good to be with you, David. So let me ask you, because we're going to be talking about this later, Republicans don't usually talk much about the environment, but are there parts of, of your district that didn't used to see flooding that are flooding now? Yesterday I was in Springfield, actually with some constituents. They have flooding. I was in Middlesex where three houses are falling into a river. Oh, yeah. See, uh, Flooding so, is a major concern. So it's probably not going to come up much in your primary, but it will in the general. Uh, do you have um, an environmental platform yet? Well, I have a platform, but I believe in global warming. Uh, I follow science, so there's no doubt that there's a problem. The question is how to solve it, and it's going to take a world. The United States alone is not going to be able to do that, but I'm not a denier of global warming. All right, but you're also not one who supports, say, Phil Murphy's energy master plan, right? Well, I think Phil Murphy got ahead of himself. You know, you're saying that this can be done in X number of years. See, that's not following science either. Huh. I mean, you have to be logical on both sides of the equation, not one. So, all right, I know your main thing is civility and balance and, and Trump is terrible, but let's see what else you got. Uh, let's talk about these NJ Transit fare hikes, right? 15% uh, the first year, then 3% annually for the foreseeable future. Does that sound right to you? What sounds wrong is not having an open debate before the legislature on the entire budget. Not don't let small groups make a decision of that magnitude. So clearly what you have to do is have an open debate, bring the public in and look at it closely. I just saw these increases in the last couple of days. So I'm happy to get down there in the weeds and start looking at where to save money. But I'm not going to do it by just sending out some platitude. Obviously, people are most concerned with cost of living. So yeah. let's have an open public hearing in the legislature, and let's look at every detail in that budget. All right. That, that sounds like a lot uh, for people, uh, Senator. But um, here we're looking for the simple answers, all right? Do they need a dedicated funding source, and is the corporate business tax surcharge the answer? I don't think the corporate business surcharge is the answer, because clearly we're chasing business out of the state. But we do need a dedicated source. And to ignore that is a mistake. We have to find out how to fund transit long term. Everyone believes in infrastructure. Everybody believes in improving transit. But then again, people go, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to pay for it. We have to figure out a way to pay for it. And as I said, I declared, let's see, uh, a couple of days ago, but I will be putting out all information that people need on where I stand. All right. So you don't want to give us a preview is what you're saying. Well, I give you a preview, but, you know, it's, it's a, it's, this is not, you know, there are no short answers for these things. You know, if you're going to become governor, you have to do it in a way where you actually look and study the issue and try to solve it, not just throw out some political statement, you know, red meat for certain constituents. Yeah. I'm not going to do that ever. All right. So the only thing you will say about that right now is that the uh, corporate business tax surcharge is not uh, on the table as a funding source for NJ Transit in your administration. Correct. We're already wor we're already the worst in the nation in treating businesses properly and trying to encourage businesses to come here. So that that's off the table. All right. And then we got to we do have to figure a way how to solve the issue of long term transit needs and costs. No question about it. All right. So what about these toll hikes now? Um, it was pretty transparent. The governor vetoed them just before election time, uh, then less than a month after uh, getting sworn in. 
the uh, the legislature uh, appears ready to, or the governor appears ready to approve these toll hikes. Bait and switch there, and are the toll hikes necessary? Well, I think you had a before the election position and after the election position. Yeah. Uh, my position is bring the Republicans to the table. Let us provide the alternatives. But if you're going to push it through through the one party system, you're not going to see Republicans support it. If you want two parties to look at solutions, do it. But don't simply dictate what the answer is and then expect Republicans to vote for it. It's not going to happen. So, but I didn't hear you say whether you thought they were necessary um, for to keep the roads up. Well, I'm convinced that I can find some savings if I'm at the table. I can't tell you whether it's all wrong, but I can tell you, you bring the Republicans to the table, and I promise you, with that debate, we'll be able to save some money. I can guarantee you that. All right. Did I hear you also rumbling the other day about the transportation trust fund. Didn't you vote for that originally? Of course. And here's why. There was no money in it. So people who come out and say, well, you voted for the gas tax. You bet I did. There was no money there. Yeah. So it's great to come out and argue, oh, you shouldn't vote for the gas tax. We also got the estate tax eliminated. And that's because we had two party system at that time. Christie was the governor. And we got something out of it. You know what we get out of these things now? Nothing. And until you have a Republican governor, you'll continue to get nothing out of these discussions. All right. Uh, I don't know how much you pay attention to social media, but every time we post a story about a candidate, any candidate, every comment is a version of, that guy sucks. Uh, here's what they say about you, all right? I I've cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, I'll give you one word, and, and you give me a response, all right? First one is rhino. Good one. And I hear it all the time. Well, interesting, this rhino was elected the Republican leader for 10 years from every Republican assembly person from every part of the state. So I guess uh, I'm Republican enough when we talk to almost every Republican elected official for a decade. But All right. One of the pro and I'll tell you one other thing when they do this stuff on social media, it gives a bad name to the Republican Party because those individuals look like they're mean spirited, which they probably are. Yeah, I mean, everybody's default position on social media nowadays seems to be mean spirited. But uh, here's another thing. He can't win the primary. Well, that's really interesting. So if I can't win the primary then how are the Republicans win the general election? It's surely not going to be based on denying the election of Joe Biden. It's not going to be based on denying January 6 activities. So let me tell you, if we have a candidate who does that or hides or dances from that, we will lose the general. So let's see. You know, I've, they said I couldn't win elections before when the Trumpers were on my right and the Democrats on my left and I won by six or seven points. So, you know, and also I won a district by seven points that Biden won by 17 points. So I think I'm electable. And I think once Republicans say, you know, maybe we should win as opposed to just be mad at somebody who has positions where they compromise sometimes. All right, so you're the first guy in. You're a Tom Kane senior, George Bush kind of Republican. Uh, some people call you a liberal, but we both know better than that. Uh, still, you're in the lane with, like, a Jack Cittarelli. Uh, I would think the main difference between you two is on Trump. Do you know where he stands on Trump? You know, I I'll let each candidate talk for themselves. I'm not going to frame other candidates. I can tell you that in New Jersey, if you don't stand up to what I believe is fabrication or what you see with your own eyes, New Jersey general election voters will never vote for you. So you'll continue to see a state that moves to the left and certain Republicans obviously feel as if, you know, whatever they say is more important than having a Republican in the governor's seat. So I say you want to win, vote for Bramley. The other question on that is, uh, are you going to split the so-called moderate vote and then leave the nomination for some wingnut on your party who's 
not going to be able to win in the general. Well, we're a year away from any of the conventions, right? I think people have plenty of time to determine who's the electable candidate, who can win a general election. I don't know who's going to be standing a year and a half from now. At that point in time, we'll deal with those kind of questions. But right now, I'm going to go forward and say, hey, listen, let's finally get a Republican back into the into the office of governor. Do you think that uh, this year, particularly and next year, um, is, is critical for the future of, of your party uh, that, you know, we're going to determine uh, is the right wing of the party going to dominate or are the traditional Jersey Republicans going to be able to put their candidate up? Is, is this the year where we're going to answer that question? Well, I'm not a political pundit, but I can tell you this. Uh, if we're going to win in New Jersey, uh, we have to basically adopt the simple terms, or should I say policies of the Republicans, small government, lower taxes, law and order. We shouldn't be the party of one person, Donald Trump. We should be the party of our traditional values. And if New Jersey goes that way and just sticks with our traditional values, we will have a strong Republican Party. We will win. There will be balance and trend. If they simply want to adopt a very narrow view of the Republican Party, the general of the voters in the general election will not accept it. We'll have one party rule and you'll watch the Democrats take us farther and farther to the left. Those are the facts. So I can prove those. I can prove those facts because we keep losing, losing and losing. All right. So one word answer. Never Trump, right? I never endorsed him. I don't intend to endorse him in the future. I don't think he represents the basic values of our Republican Party. And I don't think that he represents New Jersey Republicans if New Jersey Republicans want to win. All right. Let's see who else jumps in as we move into 2024. Uh, Senator John Bramnick, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on. Welcome to old Bramnicks. Yeah, love it. All right. I was a little doom and gloom at the top of the show, but I'm optimistic that our panel is going to contextualize all of this and make us feel better. But you know what? Heck with that. We keep punching the planet in the face. So let's talk about it with our panel, including Anjali Ramos Busolt. She is the director of the New Jersey chapter of the Sierra Club. Alex Ambrose is a policy analyst for New Jersey Policy Perspective. Her beat is climate justice and transportation. And Larry Higgs covers transportation and commuting for NJ.com. Welcome to you all. Uh, I want to talk about the intersection of our infrastructure needs and our environment. They are inextricably tied, Alex, no? Absolutely. In order to meet both our climate goals and the goal to make New Jersey more affordable for everyone, we need to invest in New Jersey transit. Listen, we keep hearing Governor Murphy say New Jersey transit is fixed. Well, if this is fixed, I'd hate to see what broken looks like. Mm. The reality is the recent proposal to raise fares is a Band-Aid solution to a structural problem which is that NJ Transit has never had a dedicated source of funding. The agency is forced to rob Peter to pay Paul, even raiding the Clean Energy Fund, a fund that is meant to advance clean energy yeah. infrastructure in our state to pay for operations. We need stable, reliable revenue to fund this agency, but a double digit fare hike is not the answer. All right, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, where is the, the pressure point uh, most visible, Anjali, between, you know, our, our continued uh, physical growth and uh, infrastructure needs and our environment. Where, where do we see the, the pressure points most? Well, um, that is incredibly important for New Jersey, David, because as we all know, we are an overdeveloped state because we're small, but we're densely populated. So how we build and how we utilize our public transportation as well as our cars is incredibly connected to how we bring open space, how do we interact with our nature um, and parks here in the state. So we have to be building creatively, but also adaptively to climate change and the flooding that we're experiencing. And so uh, NJ Transit is actually one of the clearest examples uh, that we need to be adaptive because of our reality here in New Jersey. Uh, Larry, meanwhile, we seem to be 
forever tied to the highway system. Uh, more and more of them are being built and widened where they didn't even exist before. It creates more impervious uh, surfaces and more flooding. You cover New Jersey Transit, the Port Authority and the DOT um, by extension. Do they even talk about this stuff? Well, they are taking a look at climate change. You know, NJ Transit has an entire uh, energy and sustainability committee, and they're working on a plan, which is basically a, a very far general overreaching plan to see what they can do about it. You know, you have resiliency projects that are still underway 10 years after Sandy, which really addresses the the um, the issues that were caused by climate change and flood surges and what have you, trying to harden some of those areas, you know, in the wake of uh, Trump, uh, Storm Ida or whatever you called it, uh, you know, I talked to some engineers and they said, really, that's the next phase for infrastructure engineers and transportation engineers to tackle. The gold standard used to be designing for what they called the 100-year storm yeah. of flooding. Now they said that we have to go beyond the 100-year storm to tackle some of those things, such as Ida, where we saw highways that were inland flooding and in places where they hadn't had flooding before. This is something they both agencies have to deal with. So, and the politics of all this, Anjali, we saw a, a really good example of this. You know, everyone says they're an environmentalist, but then you have a letter from the Assembly Speaker uh, and the Senate President in it, they say that the DEP is flooding the interior of Liberty State Park, when in reality they're creating wetlands to stop flooding, no? Yeah, that's that's correct, David. I mean, what the New Jersey DEP, in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers, is actually doing in Liberty State Park is the perfect example of a resiliency project that the entire state should actually be looking towards building, especially on coastal communities, because providing ways for water to actually go back to the Bay Area or the ocean or rivers is actually what's going to provide us with the tools of not flooding. So creative ways of building as, as well as bringing in um, freshwater um, wetlands or marshes, restoration of marshes, those are creative natural solutions that are actually going to provide us the tools to deal with climate change. You just can't put up a wall. Right. I mean, the water's got to go somewhere. Right. Especially if you're everything that you're going to build is going to be an impervious surface, asphalt, concrete. And we're just going to keep flooding because the water doesn't it, it doesn't have a route, a natural flow to go back to where it should be. Yeah. And, and you really see it uh, in this discussion about Liberty State Park. You know, Alex, what gets me is when commercial interests uh, tell communities of color, particularly that, you know, a big sports arena in the park is better for their community than stopping the flooding in their neighborhood. It's all, it's really cynical. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we see commercial interests uh, really overtake a lot of our environmental interests. Like you alluded to, we are a car dependent state. And that has resulted in proposals like the Turnpike expansion that will inevitably increase impervious area and increase air pollution. What we see are lawmakers who are reinforcing that we are a car dependent state. To my knowledge, there are no lawmakers that regularly take public transit. Hmm. So to them, all of these numbers like on-time performance are just numbers on a page, but they translate to real world consequences for riders, being able to pay their bills on time, being able to make it to work on time. Public transit is so important to everyday riders and they deserve better. Yeah. Uh, Larry, let's talk dollars and cents here. Uh, fare increases, toll increases. Is that gonna put more motorists onto mass transit or more strap hangers into their cars? Well, it really depends. You know, what happens is the individual commuter basically works out that at that economic arithmetic for themselves. And, you know, I mean, a classic example is driving to New York. It's not the cost of actually driving to New York that's expensive. It's the parking when you get on the other side. So you got to look at the sum total of not just what you're spending for gas, but if you're driving, what you're spending on tolls, whether you have to pay for parking when you get to your destination. 
Um, the other part of that metric is time. And, you know, is it faster to drive or is it faster to take the train? And of course, the wild card is what happens to traffic. You know, one of the arguments is being used in the turnpike widening is induced demand. The opponents are basically citing principles that actually go back to the Robert Moses era when he uh, redid his first bridge. And within a couple of years, they had to add another deck to it because more traffic came. And it's very much a field of dreams. If you build it, yeah. drivers will find out about it and take the point of least resistance until it's filled up. Anjali, back to Liberty State Park, cleaning that interior up and building out all the phases uh, over there, uh, including creation of recreation spaces, that's going to take much more than the $50 million, uh, the legislature has put up right now. Uh, but when things get tight financially in the state, as they appear to be getting, uh, these guys cut with machetes, don't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and you're absolutely right, David. $500 million is not going to cut it for $50 everything. million. $50 million, yeah, 50, sorry. yeah. For everything that uh, needs to be built and clean up at the park, these resiliency projects are very costly. Um, so New Jersey's Air Club is always encouraging the state to try to leverage federal funds as much as possible, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. to actually get this going. Because right now is really the time to to invest in these resiliency projects. Uh, Alec, the, the corporate business tax surcharge, um, it's sunset. Uh, if that's going to come back, you're going to need a, a Democrat uh, in in uh, Trenton as governor, aren't you? Because Republicans are not going to get that for you. Well, our current lawmakers, as I said, uh, to my knowledge, there are no current lawmakers in New Jersey that regularly take NJ Transit. And frankly, in my opinion, if these lawmakers who are proposing double digit fare hikes who these lawmakers who have historically tried to cut funding to NJ Transit, if they regularly had to take NJ Transit, we would have had dedicated funding yesterday. The reality is this proposal to raise fares in double digit points is one of the most inequitable ways to fund our public transit agency. We It's never had a dedicated source of funding and is still suffering under the budget cuts that Governor Christie during his administration uh, cut from the agency. So really, we should reinstate the corporate business tax surcharge or the CBT because it's the most equitable way to fund the agency. We also know it's not a new policy because uh, Senate President Sweeney and Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg both already proposed it. And we also know it's an incredibly popular policy. A recent poll from Fairleigh Dickinson University found that the majority of New Jerseyans support this idea. What do you think about that, Larry? Is there is there support for um, something like that to fund New Jersey Transit? And if not, what are you going to do to fund New Jersey Transit? Well, the interesting thing is um, I, I got a statement from the New Jersey Business and Industry Association right out of the box, basically reiterating their opposal to the uh, corporate business tax surcharge coming back. And they basically said, even without it, that we have the fourth highest business tax in the state. Now, you know, I, I interviewed a UCL UCLA professor uh, who's an expert in transit funding. And he said, you know, your options are very, very, very slim. If you put if you increase the sales tax, uh, that's considered a regressive tax. He said that's going to hit the very people that ride public transit right. and that stuck with public transit during the pandemic. And that is basically the working poor uh people who basically do not have cars, senior citizens and the disabled. So, you know, they're on fixed incomes. They depend on NJ Transit. And, you know, they there are a lot of the riders on New Jersey Transit bus. Rail gets a lot of the attention. But these are the people that even throughout the pandemic rode the bus and yeah. it's going to become more expensive for them. All right. Last question. One word answers from each of you. Um, doomed or not doomed? Anjali. Not doomed. All right, Alex, doomed or not doomed? This is two words, but not doomed. <laughs> That's true, it is two words. Larry, Larry, doomed or not doomed? You know, if you're if you're talking about com commuters, they feel pretty doomed about a fare increase. And on social media, a lot of them are saying, well, if you're going to increase our fares, we have a laundry list of what we expect. Yeah, and I'm it's, not sure if you got the, the assignment. I on time performance. I'm not sure if you got the assignment. Down. Larry, it was one word or two words. Doomed or not doomed? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say I'm going to say it's a it's a little doomed.
All right, we'll leave it on that mixed uh, review. <laughs> That's chat box for this week. Alex, Anjali, Larry, good to see you all. Thank you. Uh, thanks also to John Bramnick for joining us. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz NJ and find more content, including full episodes, when you scan the QR code on your screen. I'm David Cruz for the entire team here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.